government does not exist. Most people believe that government is necessary, though they also acknowledge that authority often leads to corruption and abuse. They know that government can be inefficient, unfair, unreasonable and oppressive, but they still believe that authority can be a force for good. What they fail to realize is that the problem is not just that government produces inferior results, or that authority is often abused. The problem is that the concept itself is utterly irrational and self-contradictory. It is nothing but a superstition, devoid of any logical or evidentiary support, which people hold only as a result of constant cult-like indoctrination designed to hide the logical absurdity of the concept, it is not a matter of degree, or how it is used. The truth is that authority does not and cannot exist at all, and failure to recognize that fact has led billions of people to believe things and do things that are horrendously destructive. There can be no such thing as good authority in fact, there is no such thing as authority at all. As strange as that may sound, it can easily be proven. In short, government does not exist. It never has and it never will. The politicians are real. The soldiers and police who enforce the politicians will are real, the buildings they inhabit are real, the weapons they wield are very real, but their supposed authority is not. And without that authority, without the right to do what they do, they are nothing but a gang of thugs. The term government implies legitimacy it means the exercise of authority over a certain people or place. The way people speak of those in power, calling their commands laws, referring to disobedience to them as a crime, and so on, implies the right of government to do, and a corresponding obligation on the part of its subjects to obey. Without the right to rule, authority, there is no reason to call the entity government, and all of the politicians and their mercenaries become utterly Indistinguishable from a giant organized crime syndicate, their laws no more valid than the threats of muggers and carjackers. And that, in reality, is what every government is. An illegitimate gang of thugs, thieves and murderers, masquerading as a rightful ruling body. The reason the terms government and authority appear inside quotation marks Throughout this book is because there is never a legitimate right to rule, so government and authority never actually exist. In this book such terms refer only to the people and gangs erroneously imagined to have the right to rule. All mainstream political discussion all debate about what should be legal and illegal, who should be put into power, what national policy should be, how government should handle various issues all of it is utterly irrational and a complete waste of time, as it is all based upon the false premise that one person can have the right to rule another, that authority can even exist. The entire debate about how authority should be used, and what government should do, is exactly as useful as debating how Santa Claus should handle Christmas. But it is infinitely more dangerous on the bright side, removing that danger the biggest threat that humanity has ever faced, in fact, does not require changing the fundamental nature of man, or converting all hatred to love, or performing any other drastic alteration to the state of the universe. Instead, it requires only that people recognize and then let go of one particular superstition, one irrational lie, that almost everyone has been taught to believe. In one sense, most of the world's problems could be solved overnight if everyone did something akin to giving up the belief in Santa Claus. Any idea or proposed solution to a problem that depends upon the existence of government, and that includes absolutely everything within the realm of politics, is inherently invalid. To use an analogy, two people could engage in a useful, rational discussion about whether nuclear power or hydroelectric dams are the better way to produce electricity for their town. But if someone suggested that a better option would be 
to generate electricity using magic pixie dust, his comments would be and should be dismissed as ridiculous, because real problems cannot be solved by mythical entities, yet. Almost all modem discussion of societal problems is nothing but an argument about which type of magic pixie dust will save humanity. All political discussion rests upon an unquestioned but false assumption, which everyone takes on faith simply because they see and hear everyone else repeating the myth, the notion that there can be such a thing as legitimate government. The problem with popular misconceptions is just that, they are popular. When any belief, even the most ridiculous, illogical belief is held by most people, it will not feel unreasonable to the believers. Continuing in the belief will feel easy and safe, while questioning it will be uncomfortable and very difficult, if not impossible. Even abundant evidence of the horrendously destructive power of the myth of authority, on a nearly incomprehensible level and stretching back for thousands of years, has not been enough to make more than a handful of people even begin to question the fundamental concept. And so, believing themselves to be enlightened and wise, human beings continue to stumble into one colossal disaster after another, as a result of their inability to shake off the most dangerous superstition, the belief in authority. Offshoots of the superstition There is a large collection of terminology that grows out of the concept of authority. What all such terms have in common is that they imply a certain legitimacy to one group of people forcibly controlling another group. Here are just a few examples. Government, as mentioned before, government is simply the term for the organization or group of people imagined to possess the right to rule. Many other terms. Describing parts of government, such as president, congressman, judge, and Legislature, reinforce the supposed legitimacy of the ruling class. Law, the terms law and legislation have very different connotations from the words to forward slash eat and command. The difference, again, depends upon whether the ones issuing and imposing such laws are imagined to have the right to do so, if a street gang issues commands to everyone in its neighborhood, no one calls such commands laws. But if government issues commands through the legislative process, nearly everyone calls them laws. In truth, every authoritarian law, is a command backed by the threat of retaliation against those who do not comply. Whether it is a law against committing murder or against building a deck without a building permit, it is neither a suggestion nor a request, but a command backed by the threat of violence, whether in the form of forced confiscation of property, e. fines, or the kidnapping of a human being, i.e. imprisonment, what might be called extortion if done by the average citizen is called taxation when done by people who are imagined to have the right to rule. What would normally be seen as harassment, assault, kidnapping, and other offenses are seen as Regulation and law enforcement when carried out by those claiming to represent authority. Of course, using the term law to describe the inherent properties of the universe, such as the laws of physics and mathematics, has nothing to do with the concept of authority. Furthermore, there is another concept, called natural law, which is very different from statutory law, i.e. legislation. The concept of natural law is that there are standards of right and wrong intrinsic to humanity that do not depend upon any human authority, and that in fact supersede all human authority. Though that concept was the topic of many discussions in the not-too-distant past, it is rare to hear Americans using the term law in such a context today, and that concept is not what is meant by law in this book. Crime, the flip side of the concept of law is the concept of crime, the act of disobeying the law. The phrase committing a crime obviously has a negative connotation. The notion that breaking the law is morally wrong implies that the command being disobeyed is inherently legitimate, 
based solely upon who gave the command. If a street gang tells a store owner, you give us half of your profits or we hurt you, no one would consider the store owner a criminal if he resisted such extortion. But if the same demand is made by those wearing the label of government, with the demand being called law and taxes, then that very same store owner would be viewed, by almost everyone, as a criminal if he refused to comply. The terms crime and criminal do not, by themselves, even hint at what law is being disobeyed. It is a crime to slowly drive through a red light at an empty intersection, and it is a crime to murder one's neighbors, a hundred years ago it was a crime to teach a slave to read, in 1945 Germany it was a crime to hide Jews from the SS. In Pennsylvania, it is a crime to sleep in or on top of a refrigerator outside. Literally, committing a crime means disobeying the commands of politicians, and a criminal is anyone who does so. Again, such terms have an obviously negative connotation, most people do not want to be called a criminal, and they mean it as an insult if they call someone else a criminal. Again, this implies that the authority issuing and enforcing the laws has the right to do so. Lawmakers, there is a strange paradox involved in the concept of lawmakers, in that they are perceived to have the right to give commands, impose taxes, regulate behavior, and otherwise coercively control people, but only if they do so via the legislative process. The people in government legislatures are seen as having the right to rule, but only if they exert their supposed authority by way of certain accepted political rituals. When they do, the lawmakers are imagined to have the right to give commands and hire people to enforce them, in situations where normal individuals would have no such right. To put it another way, the general public honestly imagines that morality is different for lawmakers than it is for everyone else. Demanding money under threat of violence is immoral theft when most people do it, but is seen as taxation when politicians do it. Bossing people around and forcibly controlling their actions is seen as harassment, intimidation and assault when most people do it, but is seen as regulation and law enforcement when politicians do it. They are called lawmakers, rather than threat makers because their commands if done via certain legislative procedures are seen as inherently legitimate, in other words, they are seen as authority, and obedience to their legislative commands is seen as a moral imperative. Law enforcement, one of the most common examples of authority, which many people see on a daily basis, are the people who wear the label of police or law enforcement. The behavior of law enforcement Forces, and the way they are regarded and treated by others, shows quite plainly that they are viewed not simply as people, but as representatives of authority, to which very different standards of morality are believed to apply. Suppose, for example, someone was driving down the street not knowing that one of his brake lights had burned out. If an average citizen forced the driver to stop and then demanded a large sum of money from him, the driver would be outraged, it would be viewed as extortion, harassment, and possibly assault and kidnapping. But when one claiming to act on behalf of government does the exact same thing, by flashing his lights, and chasing the person down if he doesn't stop, and then issuing a ticket, such Actions are viewed by most as being perfectly legitimate. In a very real sense, the people who wear badges and uniforms are not viewed as mere people by everyone else. They are viewed as the arm of an abstract thing called authority. As a result, the properness of police officer behavior and the righteousness of their actions are measured by a far different standard than is the behavior of everyone else. They are judged by how well they enforce the law rather than by whether their individual actions conform to the normal standards of right and wrong that apply to everyone else. 
The difference is voiced by the law enforcers themselves, who often defend their actions by saying things such as I don't make the law, I just enforce it. Clearly, they expect to be judged only by how faithfully they carry out the will of the lawmakers, rather than by whether they behave like civilized, rational human beings. Countries and nations, the concepts of law and crime are obvious offshoots of the concepts of government and authority, but many other words in the English language are either changed by the belief in authority or exist entirely because of that belief. A country or nation, for example, is a purely political concept. The line around a country is, by definition, the line defining the area over which one particular authority claims the right to rule, which distinguishes that location from the areas over which other authorities claim the right to rule. Geographical locations are, of course, very real, but the term country does not refer only to a place. It always refers to a political jurisdiction, another term stemming from the belief in authority. When people speak of loving their country, they are rarely capable of even defining what that means, but ultimately, the only thing the word country can mean is not the place, or the people, or any abstract principle or concept, but merely the turf a certain gang claims the right to rule, in light of that fact, the concept of loving one's country is a father strange idea, it expresses little more than a psychological attachment to the other subjects who are controlled by the same ruling class which is not at all what most people envision when they feel national loyalty and patriotism. People may feel love for a certain culture, or a certain location and the people who live there, or to some philosophical ideal, and mistake that for love of country, but ultimately, a country is simply the area that a particular government claims the right to rule. That is what defines the borders, and it is those borders which define the country. Attempting to rationalize the irrational. People who consider themselves educated, open-minded and progressive do not want to think of themselves as the slaves of a master, or even the subjects of a ruling class. Because of this, much rationalizing and obfuscating has been done in an attempt to deny the fundamental nature of government as a ruling class, a lot of verbal gymnastics, misleading terminology and mythology have been manufactured to try to obscure the true relationship between governments and their subjects, this mythology is taught to children as civics, even though most of it is completely illogical and flies in the face of all evidence. The following covers a few of the popular types of propaganda used to Obfuscate the nature of authority. The myth of consent. In the modem world, slavery is almost universally condemned. But the relationship of a perceived authority to his subject is very much the relationship of a slave master. Owner, to a slave, property. Not wanting to admit that, and not wanting to condone. What amounts to slavery, those who believe in authority are trained to memorize and repeat blatantly inaccurate rhetoric designed to hide the true nature of the situation. 1. Example of this is the phrase consent of the governed. There are two basic ways in which people can interact, by mutual agreement, or by one person using threats or violence to force his will upon another. The first can be labeled consent both sides willingly and voluntarily agreeing to what is to be done. Second can be labeled governing one person controlling another. Since these two consent and governing are opposites, the concept of consent of the governed is a contradiction. If there is mutual consent, it is not government, if there is governing, there is no consent. Some will claim that a majority, or the people as a whole, have given their consent to be ruled, even if many individuals have not. But such an argument turns the concept of consent on its head. No one, individually or as a group, can give consent for something to be done to someone else. 
That is simply not what consent means. It defies logic to say, I give my consent for you to be robbed. Yet that is the basis of the cult of democracy, the notion that a majority can give consent on behalf of a minority. That is not consent of the governed, it is forcible control of the governed, with the consent of a third party. Even if someone were silly enough to actually tell someone else, I agree to let you forcibly control me, the moment the controller must force the controlee to do something, there is obviously no longer consent. Prior to that moment, there is no governing only voluntary cooperation. Expressing the concept more precisely exposes its inherent schizophrenia, I agree to let you force things upon me, whether I agree to them or not. But in reality, no one ever agrees to let those in government do whatever they want. So, in order to fabricate consent where there is none, believers in authority add another even more bizarre step to the mythology, the notion of implied consent. The claim is that, by merely living in a town, or a state, or a country, one is agreeing to abide by whatever rules happen to be issued by the people who claim to have the right to rule that town, state, or country. The idea is that if someone does not like the rules, he is free to leave the town, state, or country altogether, and if he chooses not to leave, that constitutes giving his consent to be controlled by the rulers of that jurisdiction. Though it is constantly parroted as gospel, the idea defies common sense. It makes no more sense than a carjacker stopping a driver on a Sunday and telling him, by driving a car in this neighborhood on Sunday, you are agreeing to give me your car. One person obviously cannot decide what counts as someone else agreeing to something. An Agreement is when two or more people communicate a mutual willingness to enter into some arrangement. Simply being born somewhere is not agreeing to anything, nor is living in one's own house when some king or politician has declared it to be within the realm he rules. It is one thing for someone to say, if you want to ride in my car, you may not smoke, or you can come into my house only if you take your shoes off. It is quite Another to try to tell other people what they can do on their own property. Whoever has the right to make the rules for a particular place is, by definition, the owner of that place. That is the basis of the idea of private property, that there can be an owner who has the exclusive right to decide what is done with and on that property. The owner of a house has the right to keep others out of it and, by extension, the right to tell visitors what they can and cannot do as long as they are in the house. And that sheds some light on the underlying assumption behind the idea of implied consent. To tell someone that his only valid choices are either to leave the country or to abide by whatever commands the politicians issue logically implies that everything in the country is the property of the politicians. If a person can spend year after year paying for his home, or even building it himself, and his choices are still to either obey the politicians or get out, that means that his house and the time and effort he invested in the house are the property of the politicians. And for one person's time and effort to rightfully belong to another is the definition of slavery. That is exactly what the implied consent theory means, that every country is a huge slave plantation, and that everything and everyone there is the property of the politicians. And, of course, the master does not need the consent of his slave. The believers in government never explain how it is that a few politicians could have acquired the right to unilaterally claim exclusive ownership of thousands of square miles of land, where other people were already living, as their territory, to rule and exploit as they see fit. It would be no different from a lunatic saying, I hereby declare North America to be my rightful domain, so anyone living here has to do whatever I say, if you 
don't like it, you can leave. There is also a practical problem with the obey or get out attitude, which is that getting out would only relocate the individual to some other giant slave plantation, a different country. The end result is that everyone on earth is a slave, with the only choice being which master to live under. This completely rules out actual freedom. More to the point. That is not what consent means. The belief that politicians own everything is demonstrated even more dramatically in the concept of immigration laws. The idea that a human being needs permission from politicians to set foot anywhere in an entire country the notion that it can be a crime for someone to step across an invisible line between one authoritarian jurisdiction into another implies that the entire country is the property of the ruling class. If a citizen is not allowed to hire an illegal alien, is not allowed to trade with him, is not even allowed to invite an illegal into his own home, then that individual citizen owns nothing, and the politicians own everything. Not only is the theory of implied consent logically flawed, but it also obviously does not describe reality. Any government that had the consent of its subjects would not need, and would not have, law enforcers. Enforcement happens only if someone does not consent to something. Anyone with their eyes open can see that government, on a regular basis, does things to a lot of people against their will. To be aware of the myriad of tax collectors, beat cops, inspectors and regulators, border guards, narcotics agents, prosecutors, judges, soldiers, and all the other mercenaries of the state, and to still claim that government does what it does with the consent of the governed, is utterly ridiculous. Each individual, if he is at all honest with himself, knows that those in power do not care whether he consents to abide by their laws. The politicians' orders will be carried out, by brute force if necessary, with or without any individual's consent. More mythology. In addition to the myth of the consent of the governed, other sayings and dogmatic rhetoric are often repeated, despite being completely inaccurate. For example, in the United States the people are taught and faithfully repeat such ideas as we are the government and the government works for us and the government represents us. Such aphorisms are blatantly and obviously untrue, despite the fact that they are constantly parroted by rulers and subjects alike. One of the most bizarre and delusional, but very common, claims is that we, the people, are the government. School children are taught to repeat this absurdity, even though everyone is fully aware that the politicians issue commands and demands, and everyone else either complies or is punished. In the United States there is a ruling class and a subject class, and the differences between them are many and obvious. One group commands, the other obeys. One group demands huge sums of money, the other group pays. One group tells the other group where they can live, where they can work, what they can eat, what they can drink, what they can drive, who they can work for, what work they can do, and so on. One group takes and spends trillions of dollars of what the other group earns. One group consists entirely of economic parasites, while the efforts of the other group produce all the wealth. In this system, it is patently obvious who commands and who obeys. The people are not the government, by any stretch of the imagination, and it requires profound denial to believe otherwise. But other myths are also used to try to make that lie sound rational. For example, it is also claimed that the government works for us, it is our servant. Again, such a statement does not even remotely match the obvious reality of the situation, it is little more than a cult mantra, a delusion intentionally programmed into the populace in order to twist their view of reality. And most people never even question it. Most never wonder, if government works for us, if it is our employee, why does it 
decide how much we pay it. Why does our employee decide what it will do for us? Why does our employee tell us how to live our lives? Why does our employee demand our obedience for whatever arbitrary commands it issues, sending armed enforces after us if we disobey? It is impossible for government to ever be the servant. Because of what government is, to put it in simple, personal terms, if someone can boss you around and take your money, he is not your servant, and if he cannot do those things, he is not government. However limited, government is the organization thought to have the right to forcibly control the behavior of its subjects via laws. Rendering the popularly accepted rhetoric about public servants completely ridiculous. To imagine that a ruler could ever be the servant of those over whom he rules is patently absurd. Yet that impossibility is spouted as indisputable gospel in civics classes. An even more prevalent lie used to try to hide the master-slave relationship between government and the public is the notion of representative government. The claim is that the people, by electing certain individuals into positions of power, are choosing their leaders and that those in office are merely representing the will of the people. Again, not only does this claim not at all match reality, but the underlying abstract theory is inherently flawed as well. In the real world, so-called representative governments are constantly doing things their subjects do not want them to do, increasing taxes, engaging in warmongering, selling off power and influence to whoever gives them the most money, and so on. Every taxpayer can easily think of examples of things funded with his main, that he objects to. Whether it be handouts to huge corporations, handouts to certain individuals, government, actions that infringe on individual rights, or just the overall wasteful, corrupt, inefficient, bureaucratic machine of government. There is no one who can honestly say that government does everything that he wants and nothing that he does not want. Even in theory, the concept of representative government is inherently flawed, because government cannot possibly represent the people as a whole unless everyone wants exactly the same thing because different people want government to do different things, government will always be going against the will of at least some of the people. Even if a government did exactly what a majority of its subjects wanted, which never actually happens, it would not be serving the people as a whole, it would be forcibly victimizing smaller groups on behalf of larger groups. Furthermore, one who represents someone else cannot have more rights than the one he represents. To wit, if one person has no right to break into his neighbor's house and steal his valuables, then he also has no right to designate a representative to do that for him, to represent someone is to act on his behalf, and a true representative can only do what the person he represents has the right to do. But in the case of government, the people whom the politicians claim to represent have no right to do anything that politicians do. Impose taxes, enact laws, etc. Average citizens have no right to forcibly control the choices of their neighbors, tell them how to live their lives, and punish them if they disobey. So when a government does such things, it is not representing anyone or anything but itself. Interestingly, even those who talk about representative government refuse to accept any personal responsibility for actions taken by those for whom they voted. If their candidate of choice enacts a harmful law, or raises taxes, or wages war, the voters never feel the same guilt or shame they would feel if they themselves had personally done such things, or had hired or instructed someone else to do such things. This fact demonstrates that even the most enthusiastic voters do not actually believe the rhetoric about representative government, and do not view politicians as their representatives. The 
terminology does not match reality, and the only purpose of the rhetoric is to obfuscate. The fact that the relationship between every government and its subjects is the same as the relationship between a master and a slave. One master may whip his slaves less severely than another, one master may allow his slaves to keep more of what they produce, one master may take better care of his slaves but none of that changes the basic, underlying nature of the master-slave relationship. The one with the right to rule is the master, the one with the obligation to obey is the slave. And that is true even when people choose to describe the situation using inaccurate rhetoric and deceptive euphemisms, such as representative government, consent of the governed, and will of the people. The notion of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, while it makes nice feel-good political rhetoric, is a logical impossibility. A ruling class cannot serve or represent those it rules any more than a slave owner can serve or represent his slaves. The only way he could do so is by ceasing to be a slave owner, by freeing his slaves. Likewise, the only way a ruling class could become a servant of the people is by ceasing to be a ruling class, by relinquishing all of its power. Government cannot serve the people unless it ceases to be government. Another example of irrational statist doctrine is the concept of the rule of law. The idea is that rule by mere men is bad, because it serves those with a malicious lust for power. While the rule of law, as the theory goes, is all about objective, reasonable rules being imposed upon humanity equally. A moment's thought reveals the absurdity of this myth. Despite the fact that the law is often spoken of as some wholly infallible set of rules, spontaneously flowing from the nature of the universe, in reality the law is simply a collection of commands issued and enforced by the people in government. There would be a difference between rule of law and rule of men only if the so-called laws were written by something other than men.